Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we have a Bandit Commandery Guide video. Now, previously we have covered all the Bandit counties, so if you missed that video, please definitely go check it out. It should be in the same playlist as this one, and I'll also link it in the description below. In that video, we have already ran down all the specialty counties for all the Bandit factions. They are going to be slightly different than the ones you're used to from the base game. And today we're going to talk about how we should approach building our economy for various commanderies in the game for the bandit faction. And one of the key aspects for bandits is that they now can build these specialty buildings inside each county. So for, for each specialty county you control, you now gain additional building slot that you can build one of these four buildings in. Now these four buildings are the black market, food tents, preparation camp, Mustering ground. So starting with the black market, this is going to be your income option. By building this, you gain 10 prestige, 50 banditry income, which we already talked about in our county video, is a special source of income for the bandits. And you get 50% boost to banditry income in the local commandery. Food tent have a 50 gold upkeep per turn. You gain 15 prestige, 8k population growth in local county. So only in the county you're building it in, not in every county in the commandery. Plus three public order and plus three loot. Preparatory camp is 10 points of prestige, 5% research rate, and plus one cover gain per turn when spying for all undercovered characters. And lastly, we have the mustering ground plus 10 prestige, minus 5% redeployment cost faction wide, minus 5 public order for adjacent enemy commanderies, and plus 10% replenishment rate in local commandery. Of these four county buildings, the only two that you should ever consider building is the black market and the preparatory camp. The food tent is the worst building here. You should almost never build it. There is no situation where the food tent is worth it. Not only do you lose a lot of income from the upkeep per turn, you also don't need to gain the 8k population growth in the local county because the population limits of each individual county is maxed out at 500k. So even if you focus a lot of population growth in these counties, they're not going to contribute much to your all income source bonus from the population bonus part of the income because most of your population cap is going to be in the settlement itself rather than these individual counties. Public order is also a bad stat for bandit factions because a high public order, you get negative penalties because bandits play in a similar fashion where it's best to keep a neutral public order rather than a max 100 or a minimum minus 100 public order. Hitting somewhere in the middle where there is no effect is probably the best option because you will lose certain stats when you're at very high or very low public order. Plus three loot is the similar stat to military supplies. While loot is very valuable for the bandit playstyle, as loot can be transferred into sharing the spoils, which can give you huge income boost, there are many, many ways to boost loot, and you really don't need to invest one of your key building slots to that stat. So stay away from food tents. Mustering ground is situational, and it's probably only good in the early game. When you're starting out and you have a few tough fights, with your main army and you really need that 10% replenishment rate. Later on in the game, you're going to find your army with very, very high replenishment rate because you have max loot pretty much at all time if you build your faction correctly and you can share the spoils every single turn and guarantee an extra 25% replenishment rate. So you're going to hit that max 50% replenishment very easily to the point where you don't need to invest a building slot for that. So the only two buildings you should really consider here is the black market and the preparatory camp. The black market is your staple income building. You built this to maximize your banditry income, give a little multiplier to the banditry income in the commandery. Preparatory camp is for your less income focused commanderies. Now these are gonna be your commanderies with one or two counties because you're really going to be only focusing on commanderies with three counties. 
Sometime, if the two counties that's included is really good, you might consider two county commanderies to build up. But most of your income focused commanderies are going to be three county commanderies because counties is what provide most of your income source. Preparatory camp is great for those commanderies where you don't have three, right? You have two very poor counties, maybe just a farm land and a livestock farm. Instead of pigeonhole yourself for more income, which is very minimum from the black market building, you might just opt for a preparatory camp and boost your research rate and cover gains for your spies, which can add up quite nicely. And getting those reforms out early can be very helpful because there's a lot of faction wide bonuses on the bandit network reform tree. So, with that said, let's talk about some other factors that's going to affect how we build our economy for the bandit factions. One thing we need to note is that there are limited settlement building options inside your settlement counties. As you can see here, for each category of the Wuxing synergies, you only have two buildings instead of typical three. Missing from the industry is state workshop. Missing from the green is going to be your government support. Missing from the blue is your school building. The red got pretty much revamped. You only kept the forge. You have a new bandit building. And you're missing the conscription and the military infrastructure. And in the yellow, you're going to be missing your temple and tax collection. And you got replaced with something called the tribute hall. Now, the key takeaway here from this type of limitations on your settlement is that one, without a state workshop, you're going to be having no base industry income. And we already talked about in yesterday's video covering the counties, all the bandit counties don't provide their standard income source. They will all provide banditry. There's only a few exclusive counties like the Jade and the Salt Mine that will still provide 300 industry income, which is a lot less than their typical version at tier 5, where they scale up to 500 base industry income. No government support also means you're not going to get a big boost to your peasantry income in terms of multipliers and food multiplier. That's going to be a big thing restricting your development for peasantry income, even though you do have access to land development. The no conscription option in the red tree means that you won't be able to increase your seasonal deployment limits. And lastly, no tax collection means you have no early game free peasantry income, and you're also going to be missing a huge chunk of your peasantry income where you depended on that for most of your peasantry income built in the base game. Now, these four factors also represent the four types of building that you might want to keep in case you capture a Han settlement. So if I capture, you know, a very high level Han settlement from a Han culture faction and they already have a high tier state workshop or a high tier government support or a conscription building, I might not convert that. And by convert, I mean demolish because you can't convert these buildings because you have no building option that uh, complements the option. So you kind of just want to keep these because they could shore up certain weaknesses that you have. So, for example, if you capture a food commandery, something with a farmland, say, and then the AI already built a government support there and you capture it, don't demolish it, keep it. You still be able to enjoy the stat on it and you can supplement uh, that build with a land development and you can just turn it into a food focused commandery. Now, Obviously, because of these weaknesses, you might want to consider just not taking settlements, but sometimes that option is not up to you because a lot of military decisions and, you know, smart tactic require you to take control of land. Leaving the settlement behind for some faction that could backstab you could hurt you a lot. Now, another option you could have is put an underling, which is the uh, bandit version of the administrator in these commanderies that you capture, and then you offer them independence. Which is, which is a new court option that was unlocked with this patch 1.5. So you spawn a new independent faction, and then you try to vassalize them or offer them a coalition to keep them under your wing, and it prevents you from having a big major faction that could definitely backstab you being deep behind your lines. Now, talking about underlings, uh, we have to first look at settlements because settlement themselves carry heavy penalties if you upgrade them too much. First on the left, we have the small city, which is the typical first step in any commandery build, 
because at this point, you not only have walls for the settlement, you also have access to most of the level four upgrades for the buildings. Now, this is typically your starting point, and the stats you see on this uh, stat, uh, settlement card, and the stats you see on the settlement card is very similar to the base game. The only thing missing is that you don't get extra peasantry flat income on the settlement themselves, and you don't gain any prestige. But if you move to a small regional city for the bandit faction, it says your faction struggle to maintain a city of this size, downgraded to restore order. What happens is you will lose public order in local commandery. Now, this is not a bad thing. We mentioned early on, you want to keep a pretty neutral public order. So having this negative public order can actually help you in the long run. So don't think of this as a bad thing. You get 50% income from commerce, but you don't gain any flat peasantry income, and you don't gain any prestige. But most importantly, you get hit with a 5% corruption to local commandery. Now, this will prevent you from seeking out a lot of the tall build. So there's two things we can utilize to kind of counteract this. One, we can give all of these tall commanderies that we decide to build a underling or the bandit version of the administrator. Unlike the Han administrators, instead of decreasing corruption by 30%, the underling can only decrease it by 20. So it's a little weaker, but it's strong enough to counteract even from the negative stats gained from an imperial city, as you can see, which adds 20% corruption back. So you can kind of counteract your tall build with the underling. Now, you might not want to go tall in most of your commandery. You could definitely go small regional city, gain access to the top tier upgrades of all your buildings. Let's say you want a level three forge. You can upgrade your settlement to a small regional city, upgrade your level two forge to a level three forge of your choice, whether it's weapons or armors or bow, and then you downgrade the settlement back down and you lose this corruption and you still have access to that very nice upgraded building. So there is a lot of options you can try to kind of counteract the anarchy nature of bandit settlements. So knowing all of these, there is a couple tiers of commanders that you should consider owning as the bandits, because if you could get away with not owning some settlements, you're going to be doing a lot better. So the first tier we're going to talk about is three county commanders with a harbor. So there's only four of these. Uh, in total, there are 16 harbor commanderies. If you want a detailed rundown of that, it's provided in the spice and silk uh, commandery guide video because we talked about how harbors can be used to boost silk. And I provided a pretty detailed rundown of all the harbor commanderies. But here we have four harbor commanderies that also have three counties. Now the order listed is not a tier list. It's basically alphabetic order. Changwu, Jiangyang, Nanhai, Shoufang. So of these four, let's take Shoufang and talk about it real quick. So Shoufang has three counties. If we keep the bandit versions of these counties active uh, at top tier, we can build a black market in each of them to give each of them farther 50 points of banditry income and 50% increase to banditry income. And for the settlement itself, we can go all the way up to a six building slot regional city built. And what we want here is we want to have the level five uh, grant trading port, which is a harbor building upgrade that provides the most flat commerce income and commerce boost. You don't want the silk version because you don't have access to silk income. All your silk traders provide banditry income. You want to get yourself a grand tea house, or if you don't have tea, go for the other version, the grand uh, guest house. And the banditry stronghold will add another 150 banditry flat income. You definitely want the private workshop upgraded all the way to the 190% commerce. And because you have a salt mine here, so you do have a little bit of base industry income, you could definitely consider building a labor building, which get 40% and provides you 80k population boost, which will get you access to those higher tier population income to all sources boost. So that's definitely something you want to consider. And lastly, you want to top it off with another 150% from commerce. And if you look at the income breakdown of the commandery without bonuses from reforms, from administrators, from assignments, just from the buildings themselves, what we're going to have 
is a commander that can produce 5,140 income per turn. Now, this is without any special boost, just from the buildings themselves. Now, obviously, you're going to lose some to potentially corruption, but that's something you have to consider in terms of empire building as a whole, how to set up your imperial court to minimize uh, your corruption and how to get the right reforms, which is something I'll talk about in a later guide next week, because I'll be talking about a guide where how to exploit bandits, you know, how to get the most income, how to get free units, how to get no corruption. Because there's ways to do that with the bandits. They scale very well uh, with a lot of their reform and buildings. So here's one build you can definitely approach with Shoufeng. Now the next tier of commandery building is commanderies that have three counties but don't have a harbor. And there are eight such commanderies in the game. So in total, 12 three-county commanderies in the game out of about 78 commanderies. And four of them have harbor. Eight of them do not have harbor. So the ones that do not have harbor, there's, they're not all the same. Certain ones are really, really good. For example, Changsha. Changsha is super good because it has the tea and the trade port. So one way you can build Changsha is that you can get the commandery, build everything according to the bandits, and pump out a black market in all three of these counties. So you have your trading port providing 200 banditry, 15% research rate, plus a black market. You have your T, which is 125 plus 50, but you also get 300 commerce. And we've already seen how great commerce is just because you have such high percentage boost to commerce income. And lastly, the armor smith also provides 200 income to banditry plus the 50 from the black market. So if you complete this build uh, over here with just a city build, a four slot build, but we're going to cheese out the level 5 upgrades for each of the building by going up to a small regional city to upgrade these buildings to tier 5 and then downgrade your settlement back to a city. So this allows you to not deal with the extra corruption and the only thing you really lose is 25% income to commerce boost that you would have had on a regional city build that you don't have on a city build. But that extra 25% Versus having 5% corruption, definitely give up the 25% from commerce. And with this simple build of just a city and your counties, you can hit up to 5,237.5 income per turn. But the key here is that I did something else to get to this income. The 750 base commerce income is contributed by keeping a Han version of the trade port. So basically, you want to capture the trade port later on in the game after an AI's faction has already upgraded to level 5. And from that, you get 200 base commerce income without any extra bonuses. So this is depending on what you think about is more worth. Getting extra 15% research rate plus 200 banditry income, which is only boosted uh, by 150%. Versus going for 200 extra commerce income boosted by about 400 something percent. So obviously money wise, getting this Han version is going to help you out more. But perhaps it's too much maneuvering and you might just want to stick with 15% extra research rate and just go with the bandit version and add in black market. You lose out on a little bit of income, but it will still be pretty decent. Uh, another way that you can deal with these three county settlement is using an example like Poyang. So Poyang has Weaponsmith, Iron Mine, Copper Mine. These are the best three county combo you can find in any commandery in the game because each of them provides you 200 flat banditry income. So this is the only commandery in the game that will give you 600 banditry income just from the three counties. And not only that, you can add a black market for each of them, boosting them to 750 with 150% boost. But for those of you who have seen my Yanbai Hu campaign, you know this is not the end because you can also capture the settlement, add in a bandit stronghold, cheese out the level 5 building, or even if you don't cheese out the level 5 building, you go for a 125 base increase for level 4, that's still fine. You add some random utility building for the other two, maybe a tribute hall to reduce the cost of construction, also increase faction wide post battle loot, or a forge to get you some items. But at the end of the day, what you really want is a super high base 
banditry income. So here on the right, this is the Poyang commandery that I currently have in my Yanbai Hu campaign. The base income is 875. I didn't cheese out the level 5 banditry building, but if I had, which wouldn't cost me very much time, I would have 900 base. That's not a big difference. But what you want to do is summon as many armies of one general as you can in that commandery and have them sharing the spoils. Because sharing the spoils, which costs you 45 loot or basically 45 military supplies for the bandits, you get 200% income from banditry and 200% food from banditry. Both of these shouldn't be overlooked because certain counties will provide you banditry food and you can use this to get a lot of food real quick. But the 200 income from banditry is what we're focused on here. Because if you look at the percentage boost I have in Poyang in my game, I have 3,481% boost to banditry income from sheer amount of armies in my county. And that gives me 31k banditry income per turn. And it's insane because I also have picked out my court to generate additional loot per turn to the point where I will never drop loot, even if they're constantly on sharing the spoils. Means I can passively generate more than 45 loot per turn on all my characters, which means every single army I have will always maintain full loot no matter what. Now there's obviously some penalties to this because you lose movement when you have full loot, so it makes conquering on the battlefield a little bit more difficult, but by having this one commandery, just by owning the counties, I can generate 30k of income. And this is not even using up all my army slots. I have actual armies fighting. These guys are just single generals without any retinue, so they don't incur any additional cost. Standing there on the battlefield, sharing their infinite loot to give me extra income in this county. So this is something you can do wherever you start out on the map. Even if you don't have Poyang as an ideal county, if you have any of the three county commanderies you see earlier on the list, you can go with this approach. Now lastly, there is going to be a third tier here, which is two county plus harbor commander. There's four of these as well. And if we look at them, there's a few that stands out. Jian Ye, uh, copper plus salt. So if you keep just the bandit versions of this building combination, what you will have is 300 industry income on the salt commandery and everything else would be pretty standard. Now for these special ones where you have iron and badong, you have copper and salt and jian ye, you might want to consider not converting, similar to how we showed you to not convert with the trade port in Changsha. The strategy is very similar. If the Han AI version is better, try to capture it where you have that building in place and then you can utilize maybe 500 income from copper or 500 income from salt, 500 income from iron, and you can build up a forge, a labor building, and a private workshop to provide 100% industry boost. Now logically, because most of the percentage boosts are going to be on commerce income, any counties with a T is going to be great for bandit factions, any county with a harbor is going to be great for bandit factions. So these are all things you should keep in mind when building commanders for the bandit faction. So that wraps up our guide. I hope you guys enjoy this commandery building guide and hope it makes building up for bandits a little bit less confusing because what you really want is a county focused economy that's heavily boosted by generals sharing the spoil. Because think of that as a special assignment for your faction uh, with infinite slots as long as you have building uh, army slots as long as you have army slots so other than that if you have to take a commandery uh, focus on utility most of the time for you know random commanderies where you just have a livestock farm and a farm you might just want to build a forge so you can get some decent item for diplomacy you might want to build a tribute hall so you get nice increases to faction white post battle loot and in most of your commanderies where you're really not needing to focus on income you just want to get preparatory camp to boost that research rate so you can pick up as many reforms as you can. 
So that's the guide. Hope you guys like this. We'll come back next week to talk about some more tips and tricks with Bandit Factions and start talking about the Bandit Network reform map. So see you guys then. Bye.